أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Dear viewers, السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته In this holy month of Ramadan we have been speaking about the benefit of contemplating on the Holy Qur'an, implementing its advice, learning from it, becoming a friend and a companion to the Holy Qur'an, memorizing it, reciting it. These are all benefits that Allah has given to you and I, which are waiting for us to be, for us to take from this Holy Book. If only we begin to open it and spend time with it. If only we study it. If only we contemplate on it. If only we read the tafsir. Unfortunately, there is no in-depth tafsir which is complete in the English language, but there are many abridged versions which are available. At the least, we can begin with this. Not only can we read the Quran in Arabic, we can read its translation, we can also begin to read partially the tafsir of this ver these verses. Why they were revealed, what took place, what event took place, what is the meaning, are they connected to other verses? Have the Ahlul Bayt والسلام, said anything about these verses? Have they had a tafsir, have made a tafsir, given a tafsir, written a tafsir about these verses? Something we need to be very careful of when we come to interpreting the Holy Quran is not to interpret it with our own opinion. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, has a tradition in which he says, Allah the Exalted has said, those who interpret my words with their own opinion do not believe in me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the Qur'an, some verses are clear and some verses are ambiguous. Those ambiguous verses as well as the clear verses require us not to imprint our interpretation upon them. Otherwise we will begin to extrapolate a religion for ourselves, a new religion, a religion that I desire. That when I desire something, I will use verses of the Qur'an in order to affirm my desire and my want. Rather, we need to go to those who know the Qur'an, the Ahlul Bayt We need to make sure our interpretation of the Qur'an does not contradict other verses of the Qur'an and that even the ahadith that we choose and we select and learn from, they too do not contradict the Holy Qur'an because many ahadith have been fabricated so we need to ensure that we do not contradict the Qur'an. It's for this reason that we go to books of tafasir of scholars who are well versed in the sciences of ahadith and Qur'an and fiqh and understand logic so that they can ensure that the tafsir that they give to us and they write down is not something that has been infused with their own understanding and interpretation rather it has come from our sources. There are many ahadith like that and other hadith the sixth holy imam says whoever interprets the Qur'an with his own opinion if he is correct, will not be rewarded. And if he is wrong, he'll bear the burden of the sin. So even if one does come about with the correct interpretation, he won't be rewarded because he didn't go through the right channels. The ends does not justify the means. One has to go through the right method. Yes, he may have been correct in one interpretation of one particular verse, but if he exercises the same method in trying to find out the interpretation of another verse, he may be wrong. In understanding the Surah of Yusuf that we have embarked upon in this holy month of Ramadan, we came across the verse where Zuleikha has now tried to seduce Yusuf. She prepared the grounds, she emptied the room, she closed the doors, and then she summons Yusuf. But Yusuf doesn't come in the way that she wants. She, he doesn't come to her. So then she decides to pounce upon him. She decides to try and take the first step to seduce him. As she comes to seduce him, the Qur'an says, وَلَقَدْ هَمَّتْ بِهِ She came to him, وَهَمَّ بِهَا He would have come to her, لَوْلَا أَنْ رَأَى بُرْهَانَ رَبِّهِ Had he not seen 
the proof of his Lord. What is this proof that he sees from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? In different tafasir, we find different ahadith mentioned. Some are clearly incorrect and fabricated and come from different sources. What we can understand from this Burhan is that Yusuf now sees how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hand is in everything. He sees how everything moves with the permission of God. He sees that the will of God is being exercised and unfolded in front of his eyes. When somebody sees the handiwork of God all around them, they cannot go against this master. It's impossible. As Allah says in the Quran, سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ We shall reveal unto them our signs in the creation and in themselves so that and until it is clear for them what the truth is. Allah reveals these signs continuously. He is making the plants grow. He is moving the winds. If only you and I could see it. As the Imma tell us, had these sins not covered our hearts, we would have seen the Malakut of the Sama. We would have seen the celestial kingdoms. But these sins are covering our hearts. We are not able to see with the eyes of our hearts. We simply see with these physical eyes that we have. Yusuf doesn't go towards her because he sees Allah around him. It's not possible to disobey God when you see him. For example, if the 12th holy Imam was standing next to us right now, would we sin? Would we go against his commands and the command of Allah? It's impossible because you see a greater authority. You would never dare go against that greater authority when you love him or love her. In the same way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has manifested himself to his beloved creatures, to Allah. He has manifested himself to Yusuf, to the Prophet and to the awliya of Allah. It's possible for you and I to reach this stage as well. But we need to cleanse this heart. Now that Yusuf sees God around him, sees the handiwork of God, he can't move towards such a sin. It doesn't cross his heart. It doesn't even come to his mind. And Allah says interestingly, كَذَٰلِكَ لِنَصْرِفَ عَنْهُ السُّوءَ وَالْفَحْشَاءَ And such do we remove away from him evil and indecency. إِنَّهُ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا الْمُخْلَصِينَ This is where it proves to us that Yusuf has been given Isma. That evil that comes towards him is deflected away from him. Not because he doesn't have a desire for evil, but because his control over himself is so great that evil can't touch him anymore. As evil tries to come close to him, it redirects away from him because he is too strong to allow any evil to be whispered towards him. And then Allah says, إِنَّهُ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا الْمُخْلَصِينَ Surely he is from our purified servants. Interestingly, the word, the word mukhlas is different to the word mukhlis. Mukhlis is one who is a doer, a fa'al, one who tries to cleanse themselves. You and I would be individuals who try and purify ourselves. And inshallah, one day we will reach this stage, we will be purified. Mukhlas is one who has purified himself to a state where now Allah completes his purification. Allah has purified, he becomes the object here of purification. Allah has purified Yusuf to the extent now that evil and indecency doesn't even come to him. That doesn't mean he's a robot, that doesn't mean he's angelic, that he doesn't have these desires, he still has them. But because of his determination and strong control over them, nothing is able to come onto his path. Now Yusuf sees that Zuleikha is running towards him. So naturally, he does that act that will free him from her trickery. And that is that he runs towards the door. He runs towards the door, but she goes and as he's running, she's trying to pull him back into the room. So she holds on to his shirt and the shirt rips. As the shirt rips, the door opens. And when the door opens, the most embarrassing situation now occurs for Zuleikha. She finds that her master, or as we understand her husband, is standing at the door. Her husband is standing at the door with some people from her family, one of them being a young child. Straight away she tries to profess her innocence by saying that he's the one who tried to seduce me. He tried to run to me. He tried to attack me. In this situation, you and I realize how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks after his beloved servants. If a wife is telling the husband that this individual has tried to attack me, most likely in every situation, the husband would listen to the wife. He trusts his wife, his spouse. 
He doesn't trust this individual who's working in the house as much as he trusts his wife. He would have accepted what the wife said. Yusuf, yes, he says and he professes his innocence, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes a miracle to occur. Allah looks after his servant. Allah looks after Yusuf because of his purity. Allah says that if you come towards me one step, I will come towards you ten, tenfold. You come towards me a hand span, I'll come towards you an arm's length. You just have to take the first step. Just stand up for the sake of Allah. Take some sort of action for the sake of Allah. He will come running to you. So Allah inspires a young child from the family of Zulaikha to call out. And the young child says that if the shirt is torn from the back, then he's innocent because he was running away. And if the shirt is torn from the front, then she's innocent and he was attacking her and she was trying to defend herself. It becomes clear here to the king, to the, uh, to the Aziz, that it's his wife who's at fault. So, so he tells Yusuf, Yusuf, أعرض عن هذا. Yusuf, please forget this, put this aside. وَاسْتَغْفِرِي لِذَنْبِكَ And then he tells his wife, now seek forgiveness for your sins. Yusuf could have taunted her here. Yusuf could have made mention and made a great fuss about this. Yusuf could have kept on recalling this event. Yusuf could have brought about punishment on this woman. Yusuf could have gone out to the world and told them what's happening and what happened to the wife of the Aziz. But look at how magnanimous he was. That she has made a mistake. She has committed a sin. If she repents, then he will forgive her. And it seems that she may have repented in that moment because the king was there and the Aziz was there and he's asked her to repent. Most probably she repented. So Yusuf doesn't bring this up again. Of course, what's about to unfold is proof that it still remained in her heart. She didn't get what she wanted, so she was willing to try again. This is a principle that I'd like to touch upon before we conclude. That this nafs, this nafsul ammara, this nafs, this most basic level of our soul that desires ease, laziness and evil, it doesn't stop. When it wants something, it will keep going at it. It will keep try, trying to knock every door. It will try what it can until it achieves that desire, that ill that it wants. In the same way, Zulaikha wanted Yusuf. She tried it in one fashion, it didn't occur and it didn't happen. So now she's going to try it in another fashion. Here, the word gets out. The word gets out to the chief women within the society that the wife of the Aziz has been infatuated by her male servant. That she's infatuated with his love. They're all laughing at her. They can't believe that such a woman with such a status has fallen in love with a servant despite the fact that she is already married. So now Zulaikha wants to bring about an environment where she can prove to these women of the town why she did what she did and why she is in love with Yusuf in the physical manner in which she is in love with him. When we speak about this type of love between an individual infatuated with another, it should remind us of the love that we should have for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. حُبُّ اللَّهِ نَارٌ لَا يَمُرُّ عَلَى شَيْءٍ إِلَّا إِحْتَرَقٍ The love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is such that it doesn't pass anything but that it annihilates it, it perishes it, it burns it up. That's how the love of Allah should be in our hearts. As soon as Allah enters our hearts, nothing else will ever enter it. Imam Hussain says, one who has found you, what has he lost? And one who has lost you, what has he found? As soon as one tastes the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing else tastes so sweet to them again. Nothing else can take this heart of Allah. Allah says, قَلْبُ الْمُؤْمِنْ حَرَمُ اللَّهِ That the heart of a mu'min, of a believer is the sanctuary of Allah. So do not allow anything to take its place apart from Allah. Don't allow anything to sit in this heart apart from Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the love that we desire. This is the love that we should work towards. This is the love that we should pray for. That, oh Allah, we beseech you and we ask you to inspire us in our hearts with your love. A love that shall never be extinguished. And this holy month of Ramadan, as we fast, Allah will listen to our dua. Allah will accept our istighfar. Let us not waste our time. Let us spend every moment that we can in remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seeking forgiveness for our sins as well as the sins of our family members and friends and continuously pray to him.
pray to him to ensure that he keeps you steadfast and that whenever two options are placed in front of you, he makes clear what is right and what is wrong so that you never take a path that will take you away from his love. وصلى الله على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين نحن